everybody needs anything else to eat or drink, help yourself, get the stuff over there. Don't forget to pay. It's pay as you go, right? Anything you don't pay for, I have to pay for. So that's not cool. <coughs> I think we have reached a new plateau for Philo Pizza attendance here. We were just talking earlier this evening. I think Michael Cummings had the record of attendance before. But, and it was space limited. I have to say that. Michael could have particularly filled People were there. Michael had a standing room only. Michael had a standing room only. But Ryan is the first time that we've had to add chairs beyond what we are capacity. So uh, either one or two things happen. Either Brian is a great draw or else people are getting lazy and they're not uh, you know, replying to the doodle time. No, it was so, a pizza. Pizza. So, so, <laughs> so anyway, um, so what we usually do is start out to see if there's you know, any announcements or anything else that are on people's minds that we want to share. Um, you know, it's a great group of people. We're getting people from many different organizations around the Washington area. And so that was the goal to begin with. So uh, that's you know, it's very um, gratifying to see what kind of attendance we're getting in this way. So anybody have anything to share out there? Something happening at your organization you want us to know about? I can report that we are really going to do the Frontiers in Phylogenetics Spring Symposium in the fall. Uh, but it will happen. We probably will still call it the Spring Symposium to remind our administrators that we're behind in the funding for this. But, uh, but it, you know, uh, we're, we're going ahead one way or another. They haven't given us the check yet, but we're just going to invite speakers and put it on them if they want to pay their way. Um, anything else? Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Then. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Brian O'Meara. Who's visiting with us from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville? Uh, Brian got his uh, uh, undergraduate degree at Harvard, PhD at Davis, and uh, I told him that's all the introduction I'm going to do. I'm going to invite him to share anything else he wants us to know about himself, his career, his future, <coughs> or what he's been up to. So. Thank you. Thanks all for inviting me. Uh, thanks to Frontiers and Phylogenetics and Smithsonian for sponsoring this. It's great. It's great to see so many people here. It's really, really impressive. Uh, yeah, so I started off at Harvard working with Brian Farrell on beetle evolution, and then went to Davis and started working on ant evolution. And through time, I sort of backed away from empiricism and more and more into comparative methods where I'm less bad. Um, and so that's what I've been doing lately. I still have a love for, for you know, insects, though most of my work lately is on plants, just where the data and good questions are. All right, so the proposal is pretty informal, so if, if you have a question during, please interrupt me. There's whiteboards hidden behind here where you can talk about stuff. Um, it should be, should be informal, it should be accessible. All right. um, so I'm talking today about dealing with the heterogeneity of life for comparative methods. All right, so first, acknowledgments. So all this work is done with my postdoc, Jeremy Beaulieu, who is eminently hireable. Okay, so, and so those work co collaborative, so definitely take note of that. Um, funding for this has come from NIMBUS, the National Institute for Math and Biological, uh, Biological Synthesis, okay, which has money for postdocs and working groups and things like that. NSF, Google, and UT Knoxville. Okay, so this is money. <coughs> so comparative methods. I was known with these for a long time. So here's two classic papers, right? Felsen Science Independent Contrast paper, and Hegel's paper for looking at correlation between traits. And so we've known to use comparative methods for, you know, <coughs> almost 30 years now. And yet, when we do these comparative methods, we often assume something like this, a tree where we have, say, a single rate on every rung of the tree. Right, so here we have a tree that has red and blue traits, and I see a slower rate of going from zero to one, or one to zero, because we have a lot more zeros on the tips. Right? And I assume that this, this model applies everywhere across life, or across whatever life I have in my tree. So it's angiosperms, hymenoptera, you know, primates. But the empiricists in the world know that, <coughs> in fact, it's a lot of diversity. Right, so here's Hymenoptera. Right? Does an ant evolve the same way that wasps and bees do? Probably not. Our methods don't really deal with that very often. But within plants, right? Here's majestic redwood. Here's duckweed. Do they have the same rate of evolution? Probably not. Right? The same selective constraint? Probably not. Right? So we should probably deal with this. Right? And we actually have empirical evidence of this. So here's a paper by Smith and Donahue looking at rates of molecular evolution. Okay? And 
the green branches are much longer and they're herbaceous things. So the things that are herbaceous might have longer, short, shorter generation times, more opportunity for, for evolution, and so they tend to have much more evolution than woody things. Right? So we know this is present. Your comparative methods often don't deal with this. Okay. Even the pauperate groups, like mammals, right, <laughs> have a lot of variation. Right? I mean, you know, whales and cheetahs and you know, possums evolve very, very differently. Right? And that's you know, a few thousand species. Okay? So let's deal with that properly. Okay. So again, we want to move away from this approach, approach that's a little, more, a little richer, and deal with biology better. So what? Why do you want to bother doing this? Lots of, lots of things we can do to improve methods. Why take this route? Okay. One's a practical reason. Right? If you use the wrong method, it might get the wrong results. Um, <coughs> back in the old days of using just parsimony, parsimony is good in many cases, but if you have you know, a model that's not fit under parsimony, you can get the wrong branch attraction and get the wrong tree. So you want to use the proper, proper appropriate method. Okay. That's fine, but also a bit dry. <laughs> we also want to make new discoveries about biology. Right? So using these methods, we can now ask new questions of life. Right? So if, we, if all we had before was a single rate over the tree, well, it's sort of interesting to think, are there, are there two rates over the tree? Right? Is there a different rate at this point in time? Okay? And so what we can do is by allowing the more flexibility and dealing with the heterogeneity of life, we should start getting questions, we're getting answers for these questions. Now, there's four different kinds of heterogeneity I want to talk about tonight. One is time. Right? So tomorrow, there will be different selection pressure on these than what there, there is today. Right? Drop them out of space, right? the environment's going to change, selection's going to change. Okay? So you'd probably be able to deal with that sort of time specific heterogeneity. Trait specific heterogeneity. Right? Trees and vines and grasses and aquatic plants evolve very differently. You'll be able to deal with that. Clade and branch heterogeneity. Right? We don't say, when such a pause with all the information and parasitic remnant of vertebrates. Okay. And finally, stuff we don't even know about yet. Right? So if you can say, okay, I have this hypothesis about growth form, how that affects heterogeneity, but maybe there are other traits I'm not looking at yet that could affect heterogeneity. So you want to have some way of discovering those, some more investigative questions. Okay. So these are all the kinds of heterogeneity you want to get at. Any questions about that? Are people, am I missing anything from this, this heterogeneity? Can you bring up? Re reproductive mode, which is add lump and trace. You think it's a different thing? Or? Nothing that I, I didn't bring up is also, right now we're just dealing with trees, not networks, too. So we have methods in, re, in review now that deal with networks, but in general, we also be ignoring networks completely. Other thoughts? Spatial, right. So <coughs> something that you can consider a trait, but it's a general enough thing now that you can say you can use things in, you know, in the Arctic to evolve something other than plants in the tropics. Good, yeah. Right, so you can measure interactions, right? So between clade and time, right? So how does you know the KT extinction affect plants or being affected, you know, birds? Okay. Good. All right. So today I'm gonna talk about two different approaches to heterogeneity that we've worked on. One is dealing with continuous traits, so traits like body size, traits like latitude, and one is dealing with discrete traits. <coughs> okay. Traits like um, red or blue. Of course, and of course these are sort of fuzzy categories, right? So I could think of red and blue as, you know, measurements on a color spectrum, so I could convert that to a continuous trait. Okay, so it's, it's fuzzy, but this is the way you divide things. <coughs> okay. So one of the basic models we have is Brownian motion, right? And so this is a scary equation. This is just a normal distribution, but across multiple characters, multiple taxa, and across a tree. Okay. And one thing we can do with this is 
you know, measure sort of you in special state estimation, you in fitting contrast, all of the things you're used to with FOSNX, just uses this basic equation and this tree. But one thing you can do to introduce heterogeneity is tree stretching, right? <coughs> so here's a, this is a toy in the 80s, it's a stretchable doll, right? And so all the fun boxing for plus 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 six. <laughs> so think of stretching a Felsenstein tree, right? And so, you know, Pagel's lambda, Pagel's kappa, they're asking with this allow heterogeneity, right? You can say, you can stretch the tree after some time period. You can stretch the tree based on speciation time or something like that, right? And so, <coughs> my big claim to fame is applying that tree stretching basically to Brownian motion. Right? Rather than having one single rate of Brownian motion, now you can have two right? by stretching some of the branches more than others, okay, or three or four. Okay, and all that is is you know, taking the blue branches and making them longer. So you can, if, if, it, if the data got affected by the model, by stretching them twice as long, or what, three times as long. Right? <coughs> and so it's a way of dealing with heterogeneity by basic tree transformations. There's other sorts of ways you can stretch trees to deal with heterogeneity too. Okay. <coughs> we also think about general models for a continuous trait change. Okay. So we think about I have some trait. How could it change through time? And one way is sort of randomly, right? It can increase or decrease slightly by chance. It's a sort of wiggling process, right? Or it can be directional. It can be sort of pulled towards some value. And for instance, the math speak. Right? <coughs> the change of continuous time, dxt, mm -hmm. is just this random wiggle, right? With some, some normal distribution, okay? Times some rate. We have a rate of wiggle here. And then being pulled towards some value. Okay? And so, which way you go depends on what you are now. So here I subtract it from the current state. Okay? So I think I subtract it from that. And then, the problem with this is to add the entire difference at once, right? So I'm being pulled over here, and one time if I move over there, I don't want to move that fast, right? Let's allow it to be scaled. And allow it to have this, this buckle parameter to pull it. <coughs> and this is known as the ornstein Unbeck process. Okay? And this is the, the heart of this model, right? You just have a little bit of wiggle, okay? With some rate, and this part alone is Brownian motion. Okay? The OU adds its attraction. So one thing that's one common misconception in literature, and something that we're partially responsible for, is that this is not the same as um, stabilizing selection. So we have paper with, with, with the title stabilizing selection. That's wrong. Why is that wrong? <coughs> so the amount of time it takes to approach an optimal model tends to be things like 10 million years, 15 million years on that order. But the actual quantitative top gen, the amount of time it takes to get to an optimum is much, much shorter than that. <coughs> and this was shown by Lynch uh, years ago, okay, where he still makes this error. Because then you realize that when we're, when we're talking about this model, it's not just talking about selection. We're talking about this you know, sort of movement of, of species through time, okay? which might be moving towards a selective peak. This is referring to the, the movement of the peak itself, not selection. So why would, <coughs> yeah, why would just the quantitative difference, why does that distinguish the two problems? I mean, you said 10 million or 15 million years. Right. So, I mean, couldn't you change alpha to make it shorter? Or oh, yeah. I mean, right. So you could think of this as a quantitative model if you made alpha really, really, really small. Um, empirically, though, it seems to be a very different distribution than quantitative analysis. Yeah, I mean, do you agree or do you want to elaborate? Mm -hmm. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes this is unfortunate because it would be great to say, you know, we have this, this amount of stabilizing selection. S is something. But we can't just sort of have this unit to it. Um, another problem in the literature that we're also guilty of is treating these as unitless parameters. Right? They're not. Right? This is the unit of the character. Right? It's nanometers. It's kilograms. Something like that. And this is previous time. And this is going to say previous time. Okay, so we actually do have units with these out. Okay. So again, <coughs> Here's this process. Yeah? Did you start with the and continuous? Good question. So the character, the character needs to be continuous. Um, so, so it's off, it's off of the color of a rubber band model. So here you can see a toddler has a, yeah, I'll get paid in a second. So here you have a toddler has a rate of wiggle in these little toddlers, and then it's attracting back to this optimum. Okay. 
So yeah, does it happen you continue straight? So in theory, you could treat discrete traits as between particular orders and do it that way. Um, also, with some of the threshold models, which Felsenstein has done and then Ravel has elaborated on, um, initially that threshold model was the model of, of, a, of a continuous trait moving discrete trait changing state as it moves. That's now been used in OU for that letting you threshold reliability. But in general, this works best for the continuous traits. Yeah, I'm going to talk about how to deal with discrete traits in a little while. Any other thoughts, comments? It took hours to show them. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the general model, okay? It's not quite general enough. So I could say, okay, I could have index these rate terms and say, okay, I have one set, one model happening here, and a different model happening here, and a different one happening here, and so forth, right? And so we can see we have a whole set of general models. Okay? And do we think that there's one sort of optimum trait that things are through time? No. We think it's something like this, where on every branch, the evolutionary, evolutionary process itself changes. Okay. So what we're trying to do with, with comparative methods, don't say to say this model is better than that model, all the models are wrong. Okay. What we're trying to do is figure out an answer to a question. And so your question could be, you know, do these fish evolve faster than these fish? Right? Are these lizards on average able to bigger value than these lizards? Right? We're talking about the parameter estimates you get, not say which model you can reject. So that's been done in this. <coughs> so this general model where everything can vary, you, you don't do that. It's terrifying. Okay. Um, single rate Brownian motion, right? That's used a lot. So if you use independent contrast, that's the model you're using. If you're using ANCML, that's the model you're using. And sometimes it makes people poo poo this as drift. Well, it's not drift, right? Um, <coughs> Lynch and Martin had a paper in the 90s showing all these various models that could reduce the Brownian motion. The brain motion actually is a representation of the tensor limit theory. I add a bunch of random things together, I get a normal distribution. Right? If I add a bunch of random, random things together across tree space, across a tree, I get Brownian motion on a tree. Okay, so the tensor limit theorem, lots of different models reduce the Brownian motion. It's a very powerful approach. Okay. But, there are other, but there are more complex models we can do too. <coughs> uh, we can do multiple mean or some mean right? So what I do is I allow this to vary, but this is constant and constant across the entire tree. It's a bit more complexity. Okay? And various people have done that. Um, do multiple rate grounding motion. So there you say, let this be zero, so I have no OU, so allow this to vary. This one too changes. Okay? <coughs> and finally, we have a model that can allow some things to vary. So I can vary this, this, and this across the tree. That's going to work we've done. Let's we'll see how that works. <coughs> so I have genome size, okay, in a group of plants, and I have woody and herbaceous plants. Okay, and here's the tree. And again, you might think, okay, there's a reason for thinking about different rate of genome evolution, different optimal for genome evolution in woody versus herbaceous plants. We can test it. Um, <coughs> I'll get back to what this shows in a second. Okay. And so what we can do in this case is compare a bunch of models. And so we compare models with AIC, okay? And all AIC tells us is how much information we're losing with different kinds of models. Okay, it's relative, we can use this as a relative measure. Okay, you find that most of my weight here is on this model. Okay, so if there are more weight across multiple models, I could, I could sort of average across the models based on their weights, not be, you know, trying to wag it to just one model. But here, I just felt confident enough to even get this model. And what you can do with that is then estimate weights. Okay. And so <coughs> for herbaceous plants, we estimate a pretty high alpha. Okay. And what you probably do is put that into half life, the one we were doing, which is um, the way you get, how, how much time it takes you to get halfway to the optimum. Um, so this is much faster than this. So this indicates almost no selection. So the rubber band is very, very weak. Okay. So no one knows the whole selection. No one knows the whole a very, very weak rubber band. Okay. Our rate of wiggle, wiggle plants evolve genome size faster. They're wiggling around a lot, lot faster than woody plants. Which makes sense when you think about this evolution. Okay. How about getting pulled to? So, for woody plants, we have this sort of mean value of genome size. And with woody, we basically estimate a certain amount of genome size. Okay. <laughs> That's 
one thing with these models, so this was the best model, they were model fitting, right? But some of the parameters here are very hard to estimate. And so here actually you look back at this plot, right? Here we see green, you see the green, the distribution of what it's like in nature, okay? So the genome size for herbaceous plants. And here we see the complex interval, that green thing. The brown, that's woody, so you see this higher distribution, but this entire brown thing is the complex interval. It actually continues to its infinite. Okay, so some of these models, it's hard to estimate things. In this case, it's because you have very little traction to a value here. If you're not being pulled anywhere, I can't tell where you're being pulled to. It makes sense that you can't estimate this parameter. It also shows why you should actually look at your data and see. Oh, that's interesting. So the questions about the Ernst and Lubeck process. Let's talk about this. Criticism doesn't occur. Um, <coughs> if you go back to our ideas of what the questions could be, right, we have different approaches that can deal with this. So then you can go over to the methods. So we have time. Right? So I could do like with paint branches, it would mention pre and post KT. Right? And say, okay, branches after have a different rate of wiggle, or they have a different attraction strength. Okay? And actually Graham's work on this a bit. Um, and you do it in various programs. Okay. If I have a tree, right, I can paint a tree and say, okay, those parts of the tree that have woody are in rate parameter one, and those parts of the tree that are herbaceous are rate parameter two. Okay. Now the problem with this, as we currently implement it, everyone already would be basic, is that you first do this discrete character painting, and then you later on estimate the rates. And it's possible that, you know, when you're getting discrete characters from a tree, you're not getting it perfectly there's some uncertainty there. Right? We're not really dealing with that model yet. So in the future, what people will be working on is joint models that estimate that discrete painting while also estimating these rate parameters. Um, <coughs> Clayator Brink can do the same thing. You can say, let's map tetrapod and having a different rate than everything else. And finally, there are general one approaches. And we usually have one we're, de we're developing called How We Dredge, which is like dredging across all this model space. Um, and there are other ones that are more politely known, surface and fair. <coughs> and what they do is rather than having a priori painting, you say, I think these blades are in this rate, and these blades are in this rate, the computer does it for you and tries different ones, and then comes back and says, yep, yeah, here's the best painting. Now, in some respect, you could say, well, that's hypothesis free science. You could say, I mean, letting the, the model drive what you see. It doesn't have to be. So you can have a hypothesis about, I think that I will find this pattern, let's see if the model finds it. Yes, it does. Check my hypothesis. So it doesn't have to be hypothesis free. But also, even if it were, there's some merit to doing just an investigative approach, right? There's all this weird stuff out there. Let's go out and see what it is, right? So we can go out and see new ants in Madagascar, or we can go out and see new rates and see our new rates in our tree. Okay. <coughs> so there are all these approaches out there in literature. Another way of dealing with heterogeneity is looking at discrete traits. So this method we have called core. And so, let's say I have woody herbaceous plants. Right? So what's the big question? Well, can you evolve from woody herbaceous and back and forth at the same rate, or are they different rates? I can't say, okay. I can imagine that when I become herbaceous, I lose the woody genes. I can't make wig wiggling anymore. And so therefore, it's an absorbing state. Or maybe they, you know, I think herbaceous plants are, you know, how it's fitter in the environment, so I see this selection pressure for things becoming herbaceous. And so note that those of you who are fans of this, it's not looking at the dissertation rates, it's looking at just trait evolution rates. <coughs> and so I can compare the one rate model and the two rate model and say, yep, the two rate model is much better. Woohoo! Found out we have two rates of evolution. So we don't know the gain or loss. And that's useful information. So it's good to know that in this case, <coughs> it's easy to go from herbaceous to woody and vice versa. I'd like to go out and figure out why that is. Okay, and that's good. Is it just, yeah, I mean, is this more like uh, MK2? Yeah, it's, 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 it's not quite MK2. Yes, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's asymmetric, but it's not quite the MK, like the MKV model, because it won't deal with, it doesn't deal with that as a tenant bias. But there are some that yeah. relate to the solution of things that are like, like Right, that's why I said it's not the busy thing, right? So, yeah. So, there's a, so there's, so there's an argument made, and it's a good one, that when you're, <coughs> Looking at rates of evolution, 
even being misled by characters that have an effect on dissertation rate. Right? So if I see on this tree, I see the thing I see is more more green than, than brown. The only way you get that is by having a dilution from brown to green. Right? One way of getting to that is having a certain state be green, only the gravity is different brown. Another way to do it is to have things that are in state green that diversify a lot faster. So the fat dissociation rate and the extinction rate. Right? But all those different processes need to be in similar patterns. Not identical patterns. Right? Which is great, because now there are methods developed um, like Bissy by Madison et al. and Gruber by Christian. Um, so I can tease those apart. Right? Um, but it's still hard to do. In this case, right now, we're just looking at, we're, we're assuming, making the assumption that, that, that this does not, not happen because we have just not constant rates. Right? But one way to advance things is to, is to add, add you know, that heterogeneity to the same model. <coughs> Other thoughts on this? Can you get, um, do you have to propose? Hypotheses a priori. I mean, you know, some of the diversification models that I saw relate to every one. Yeah, it's probably an overkill. I don't know, but I mean, could you similarly find the rate of character evolution for every one? Excellent. You're three slides ahead of me. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and not quite every branch, because we have only n data points. We don't want to estimate two n minus two estimates. But yeah, we can, we can, we can do that well. Right. So, also, I mean, this makes sense. This sort of model makes sense where we have 10 species or 50 species on a tree. Start in the area where you know, any published tree that has 40,000 species on it. Well, that's a big tree. You can probably explain more than two parameters with a tree that size. Right. <coughs> yeah. Uh, persistent above ground growth. Do you want to back me up here? Red tail, blue tail, and gray tail. Just as red tail, and that's the one that I'm missing. Um, in some things, I mean, the robustness thing can work. So, for example, if you look at the red tail, it's free tolerant. Right? And so, it could be that things that are in the areas that don't freeze are freeze tolerant. Right? They're in the field, can't prove themselves. And so, you can do a surprise clipping in some, so some of those and see if you know, maybe got those wrong, so try clipping them and see if you get the same result. At some point, you won't. Wide range, you get there. Yeah, you might disagree, but no matter what reasonable sort of cutoff you have, it works. Or it might not. Yeah. <coughs> All right, so are we done? No. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so the covariant model, something that's developed in DNA that we don't use much, it's a really kind of cool model. So it's different approaches. You know, think, think about DNA evolving. You should use a a to T rate and a T to C rate. And then G to T rate. And 
I'll follow a couple of months. Right? Now, this is making sense. And then, like, you know, the description, the PPI and the description, the description, all those good things. But it could be that you go through a period of time where you go from an on state to one you can't change to me. Right? <coughs> so maybe I go from um, a state that is not in the selection at all and can change readily to something where it must be a state where everything dies. Right? Very extreme. But this is a very extreme way of doing it where you can change and then absolutely no change. And you can reach back to one immutable model. Right? This is called the covariant model. Um, <coughs> and came up in 2001 by various authors. And so it's a very basic model where you have, you know, I have my on state, A1, and I can go from that into U1 and T1 and T1, or I can go into my off state here, and then when I'm in my off state, now I can't change to G, C, or T, I can only change back into A1. <coughs> and I think what this does is allows you to have heterogeneity in weights over the tree that are by the data. So what we did <coughs> was extend this um, which, by allowing more flexibility. So rather than having an on or off, it just allowed different weight units. Okay. So you can go from weight herbaceous to weight herbaceous, or you can go to two, two kinds of herbaceous, fast and slow, because they're really fast and slow. Or you can go to other ways of experimenting. So here in this basic here. <coughs> you can go from you know, this witty to um, this herbaceous or this witty. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So here we see um, a sort of great matrix. Right? And the reason is, though we talk about it being fast and slow, it could even be that sort of that sort of set of parameters. We'll see an example later. It's not this ladder of fast to slow. It's you know, even working in any direction. Right? But then I have this more complex model. Okay? This is a hidden model. Right? Because I can't look at a planet and say, oh yeah, I see that's herbaceous, that's herbaceous slow, that's herbaceous fast. That, that hidden, that's a hidden parameter, that's fast to slow. Right? I can't see some parts. I can't see the herbaceous. Okay? And knowing biology, you can make some guesses. right? So if you say, oaks, all oaks are woody. Wilkes probably have a very low rate of transition. The faster AC, they're a mixture of wood and herbaceous, so you can probably have faster rate there. Okay. Um, <coughs> with this hidden model, you don't actually have to do that to your assignment. You can say, all you, all you know is this woody, or this woody fast, or woody slow. And now we construct the model on the state. And there's the covariant model. So you don't say this is a slow A or a fast T. You can say, here's A, T, T, C, and it's a hidden parameter. And there's a hidden state. So does that improve anything? Boom. Right. So look at the likelihood of the data given the tree. Right. This is our transmogenous model, our transform model. And now this is actually something that's transmogenous, but it's just log of the Right? This model has a 400 log of the genome improvement. That's a lot. We've had a few more parameters and this huge improvement in fit. Okay. This could suggest that we're matching our data better. Okay. <coughs> Now, if you modify this model, you'll have different numbers of great classes, right? So you're going to have three classes, A, B, and C. It need not be that C is slowest, A is fastest. It could be such that I have this benign state A and this bias rate going from here to here, and benign state C with a bias rate going from here to here. Right? Or I could have a little border here to give me state A and I'm stuck at being woody. It can't go faster. It's a very flexible model. You can restrict the model in various ways. You can say, let it be that you know, blue bits are always Ways of restricting the model. Okay. Just as people who are used, familiar with the sort of Hegel discrete, right? you have a single sort of matrix like this, and it applies against this transition. <coughs> and so we can do this, we find, oh, another no improvement. Another 100 log Lepton matrix. Great. Okay. And so this model results in this matrix. Right? <laughs> and now what I have? Call it slow, medium, fast, and long term, and I get to really slow, I'm stuck there. Now the model has a majority state. Who can leave the person with oats? No one with oats will probably put you into a way state they can't leave from. Okay. Whereas after AC, probably down here, they're only quicker. Okay. Cool. Now you're 12, you're 16, you're 
All right, so add parameters, like it, like it improves, swell. It's actually a better model. So one thing that people are starting to look at is model adequacy. So model fit tells you that this model is not bad. And model adequacy tells you that the model is good enough. They're different questions, related, but not, they're, they're slightly different. Model adequacy is great, because you can tell you, you know, if all my models are really bad models, because we have more work to do. Whereas if our models all fit uh, for the data, are, are, are adequate to the data, then the quality is up. Faster in the innovation, do you think the model is robust to, to, to that assumption that the Asian extinction are fixed across race? <laughs> so, yeah, the question was is it robust to the assumption that um, the first question is useful? I don't think we should think that. We should have tested that. I don't think we did test that. Um, because it doesn't look like they are <laughs> equal. So. Well, no, I mean, just looking at the tree. Well, but looking at the tree, it, I mean, it could also be that you have, I mean, yeah, I mean, looking at the tree. Right, that's true. Yeah, the 2008 paper found that there was, was that wasn't correlated. But I mean, just sort of worry about it. Worry about it. But then we do think we're just going to see some kind of how how bad the vaccine is. Yeah, because they might also have to take it. Right? I mean, if you don't account for that, it could be great. Ch changes of the situation extinction. You may have many variables. Right. Yeah. I mean. The problem is if you, if you go to the, the diversity route, and then you have to make sure you have good sampling or, oh, yeah. you know, or a good estimate. Sampling, right. 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 But then you, yeah, yeah. But it, so, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying it, it, it's something that you should add some testing. Yeah, it could be an issue. Yeah, it could be an issue. Yeah, it could be an In the model, you have to allow it. So they could have the branches closer to the root having this rate of the branches closer to the tip having this rate of the Yeah, no, but that, 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 that could come out of the model, so you could just tell it from the That's what I'm thinking about is that I, I, I guess the question I'm asking is, is, is not so much uh, what are the different states in the model, but why are these states in the model? Why is this model better than the previous model? It, 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 Why, what is it? Why does the data get hit by that model? Because it doesn't necessarily the model evolution. I think that certain clays remain labile to trace, and certain clays get stuck because of ecological constraints, because of mutation constraints, because of genetic constraints. They get stuck in certain areas. There's this way you can pick that out. And so, actually, we did two tests for this model adequacy for that. Saying, you know, how does the model get better? How does it get better? <coughs> and so, one thing you do with model accuracy is say, 
Okay, let's, let's look at this outside of the model. Let's just calculate the data outside the model. Let's calculate data on this my model and a different model. Let's see which um, data set is the data set. This is the data set. Standard methods to use seek gen to simulate data for seek gen right in the house. And always the seek gen data is going to be a lot faster than the real data. But we're going to save data size. So why? Because we have one model that is very nice and perfectly beautiful. One with one peak. So it showed that that simulated data does not match all the complexity of real data because it tasted different from real data. What you do here is measure the case is actually parsing the score. Right, so okay, we have a whole likelihood model, likelihood gradient model. Let's look at some other measure of the data and see if it's different. Right, so <coughs> my observed parsing the score, you know, taking this taking just the you know, tip, tip data and the query, it's probably going to keep changing. So now I'm going to take my Best fitting old style model and simulate data sets many times in this query. And actually estimate parsing of the score. And I find that <coughs> I get, you know, many fewer changes than I expect. So that simulated data does not feel like the real data. And something, something, something in the real data is not being matched by the simulation approach. Right? Whereas our model, you know, in just a huge range, you know, 330 includes 502. <coughs> and this test, we said, okay, well, what should this data look like in this model? Well, we should see, you know, clumps. We should see, you know, a big clump of, you know, oats, and then smaller clumps of different types of pastures. Sometimes we look at a measure of monomorphic clade size. We take clades are all big clades. We take entirely one state. Cut them off. How big is that clade? Okay, the next clade is all one clade. Cut off. How big is that clade? So we get a distribution, <coughs> and then compare our similar distribution of those sizes to the real distribution. So we have the same amount of clumpiness in the series space. We find that we do the basic kolmogorov smirnov test between our simulated distribution and the real distribution under our new model, and then we should return the indistinguishable. Right? So the old model, um, the number of times it works is indistinguishable. Right? So by that clumpiness test, our models are indistinguishable from real life. Okay? So he's suggesting that it's adequate for these data sets. Okay? <coughs> Is it adequate always? No. And there could be things like diversification we're missing. Right? But it's a nice way of set showing that, like, yeah, it fits better, but also it seems to taste like real data. Okay. Um, so what we can do now is we can reconstruct these rate categories on the tree. Okay. Here's the Acapolialis. And there's this really slow absorbing state. So measure up once you once you're in the state, it is just like real. Whereas you look here pretty fast, and aspiracy is often really bad. You see lots of lots of change in growth habit in the okay. So we get this sort of so we've gone from <coughs> something about like really herbaceous, which is good, but we also now call it evolved to also develop the traits. Now we can go and say, okay, why are octopholia so slow? Have they lost the genes for herbaceousness? Are they, are, they, are they under selection for being woody? And then we can go and test based on this. Okay, so we can actually learn something new about biology rather than sort of fitting better. <coughs> There's not say uh, Joe Williams there, I have this in the analysis, right? And we're looking at tricellular versus bicellular pollen. So tricellular pollen is rain again, carry the size of the cell and bicellular pollen has to first have a mitosis and then start growing. Um, <coughs> so if you look at how pollen disperse, you find you have you know, these you know, clumps, you can figure out how much time you spend in each of these states based on these distributions, and then map the pollen tree. You find out, you know, do we have a lot of switches into tricellular and aquatic? So we can use these to actually test other hypotheses. Now, <coughs> some new work we're working on is measuring contemporary evolutionary potential. So we can do ancestral state estimation, but all we don't do is the group state estimation. Right? The same we can figure out is the ancestor of Asteraceae really fast and really slow. I can say, is this aster really fast and really slow? It could be, but fast or slow. Um, <coughs> and so you measure this overall rate of leaving, which is evolutionary potential. So you can say, okay, let's say I'm in the state. 
how quickly do I go into other states? How can I do that? Can you do that by giving me it that way? Or can you this way and that way? Or this way and this way and that way? And then you get this way. And do the same thing for this thing. You try to figure out this overall weight of moving that space, overall of the individual space, um, set up what other side has. So now we can take the all we can do is we can take our rate matrix and then take our um, estimates of what's happening at the tips, and then we can say, okay, this actor has a rate of switching to Woody at you know one per million years. And this one has a rate of five per million years. And so you can label all those. And so this is what we thought was variable U. Um, <coughs> then we'll do besides doing the model the modeling, um, also gather all the data. Uh, we look at growth habit across the planet. Right? We divide it down into cells, take all the species in these cells. These are new measure to estimate this evolutionary potential. How quickly will this lead from herbaceous to really herbaceous? What can other trigger on effect? Right? And we keep that across the planet. Um, <coughs> you say, what's happening in Australia? Right. So it could be they happen to have a lot of long plays. Or it could have multiple origins of it, but it's based on the other traits that they have. So each species. Right, so what you do is the way you do this is you how you create each species, you figure out what its range is. And then for a given grid cell, you look at all the species in that area. And then we do a five hundred degree average of the rates in that given cell. And change that number cell. Um, any other questions about that? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, the, the problem with any evolution potential is that there's this potential where you don't really understand yet. Right? We can measure this and we do this. So to actually get at that question, we thought, what's a good example of something where we think this is an evolutionary rate information? How about Hawaii? Right? Hawaii, silver storm! All these cool things were in Hawaii. So, <coughs> are they evolving? Are they going to have a fast rate of evolution? They have a fast potential rate of evolution. And so here we see, so this isn't, this, this isn't the global mean, in fact, it's the global distribution. So we, we developed a way to do um, evolutionary weighting of that for the temporal design. So as you get into distribution now, it still, does still cause you to adjust. Right? So by which species and time equally, you can get a distribution. And so for all taxa, we have sort of this intermediate rate, so this is median, and the distribution is rounded. And now, um, oh, sorry, so this is, worldwide is gray, and Hawaii is red. Like, oh, Hawaii is average. <laughs> and so, great. Well, Hawaii has a ton of invasive species. Right? So, what if the invasive species are funny in some way relative to native species? Native groups, I mean, they weren't brought there by humans, but of course they got there somehow. Right? And so, we separate the taxa out. We find that non natives are going to stand for most in the world, but natives have super high rates. And so this is a pretty cool you know, pattern that we see you know, these hundreds of species of native Hawaiian plants have a higher rate on average. Okay, here you can actually see plots of, remember, this is a discrete rate category, right? You can look at the difference. That's how you are. And so in the slow rate category, you have lots of the non natives. And in the fastest one, you have lots of natives. And, these, these, and again, these are, these are corrected for non independence. And so we have various hypotheses to get from this, right? So one hypothesis is that Hawaiian native plants are random subsets okay, of what's, what, what's in, their, in their distribution areas, right? So maybe they're not random relative, relative to the whole world. Maybe they're, they're, maybe they're just random from Central California, so if you're here, they could have gotten there. Right? So we can test for that. <coughs> so here we have potential areas where they came in from. And do a test. So from North America, right, very different. We can do a Palmar Grove Storm Off test. Um, last year we did a tail distance test for tail weeks. And we get the distance. Right? So this is a very, very different distribution. So you can eyeball and see what's the effect. Okay. How about um, uh, 
between them, between the two patients. And here you can see a big difference. Right? So we can rule out the random subset. This is not a random subset, it's stuff with the proposal. Okay. But one of us is looking at institution evolution. Right? So we are a sort of average plant, we get to Y and boom, wonderful year. And I'm going to increase my rate of evolution. Okay. Or you know, I'm going to open niches, you know, small, small, small population size effects, and many reasons, not all of them adaptive, to lead to this faster increase. Right? So let's test that. So what we do is compare sister taxa to the ones that are Y and ones that aren't. Now the Y and ones faster. Um, and this is only using this is the pair that have one taxon on each. The other that have, doesn't have enough time. Let's compare entire clades. Do that too and find the same pattern. Okay. Um, <coughs> so then what we're left with is filtering. Right? So out of this overall pool of stuff, the only ones that can actually arrive and thrive in Hawaii are those that have this high, high potential. Um, one other hypothesis we don't rule out is it's just some other trait. Like, sure, you have high potential, but your high potential is correlated with, you know, being um, woody or being monoecious or something like that. Right. So you can see, you can compare the ratio of portion of Hawaiian taxa with certain traits and portion of worldwide taxa, and then these other traits. Right. So um, wind pollination. Right? There's a bias, but not as big a bias. As this is being carried along by this. This is a much stronger pattern than this. So it's a, it's a weak test. It suggests that the Hawaiian taxa are definitely well, this sort of evolutionary potential thing, not one of these traits. So what I think is going on here is some sort of arrival and thrive thing. It's not like some uh, change. You know, it's not like you change from these traits to vice versa. It's some sort of filtering that lets you get there. So those plants that manage to get there and those managed to to survive once they arrive there, turn out much higher potential. And so you can just do this some sort of, and again, this is something that evolution doesn't see. Evolution sees that you're woody or herbaceous. It doesn't see that you're woody fast or woody slow. Right, so what's actually happening here? You expect that to be something about lifestyle and land. Right? Some of these things that have this high potential are things that often land in new environments because they can carry it somehow and, and it's meant to be able to be passed. So it's possible that this evolution potential with plasticity and the way you can come fast to evolve is that you should fix your plasticity one way or the other. So that's one potential. And then sort of still investigating. Right? How do we get this survive and thrive thing? But we still, I mean, we see this really strong pattern. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, <coughs> so a technical note, right? How do we get these distributions? We basically get a phylogenetic weight for each taxon. So the cool thing is that if you do this phylogenetic weighting, you get the same results as if you do independent contrast. Rather than just doing you know, some sort of average across species, you get, you know, you can still look at a histogram species, but it's replicated phylogeny. So it's not just this. Okay. So, you know, I've shown you some of the stuff that we've been doing in our lab to address these questions. One thing I want to emphasize is that it's not just our lab doing this work, right? So we have other people around. Um, all the genetically and field theory dogs in. So we say, okay, now we have big trees, now we have lots of data, and big questions, now we know if there's heterogeneity, what can we go for? Right? So we're, we're not developing approaches, so it's not okay. <coughs> Now that said, there's still approaches that haven't been developed yet. Okay? So here's a plot from a review paper um, showing the ways of doing this heterogeneity. Right? And of course, one way is not doing it. So you apply the same just character matrix to everything, or the same rate, continuous rate to everything. Right? That's the number one, most common. One is partition by character. Right? And this is with DNA evolution. Right? You say, okay, I'm going to have C01 and EF1 alpha have different weights. Okay. We don't do that much with, with um, comparative data yet, because oftentimes it's just a single character, but we could. Okay. <coughs> um, we could do something like discrete gamma. What if you build, build trees and you do GPR plus G and GTR plus gamma? What's the gamma thing? Well, gamma thing is just saying you have 
you know, it's a revolution. And so I have to say, how can I let you define a model with the data evolving at a rate one, or rate two, or rate three, or rate four, and add them up? Right? We can do that for more, we can do that for more popular traits. We don't. Why don't we do that yet? Okay. Using sort of a mixture model. Right? This is something that Mark Pagels worked on um, with, with the <coughs> Okay, Where it's like gamma, rather than having a bunch of different rate groups, thing, you can have different rate matrices. So when you have all there is the data, there's the rate and the tree. Okay? And what this does is just add up across different models. Okay? Our the markup model is similar to this, but rather than doing a single thing adding up across, we let you have one giant with these okay? That's something we don't do much in comparative methods yet. Okay? Uh, we can have branch heterogeneity. Right? We say that since this branch is in rate, and that's being used more than that. Finally, time heterogeneity is just it's being used a little bit, but not enough. And there are people here in the room who are working on this as well. If you think about continuous methods and discrete methods, right, we have tree stretching, right, that, you know, kappa, lambda, things like that. That's being used a lot in both. Character heterogeneity, some, right, both together, some, no. Right, so there's all these different ways you can think about spending these models, you know, you know, tree stretching or more, more, more complex models. Okay, so what I'm trying to show is a little why do you care about heterogeneity and how to deal with it and what sort of good effects you get from doing this stuff. Right, so with that, are there any questions? Yeah. You guys always have some uh, you want to post office. Mm -hmm. So questions, criticisms, yeah, Keith. No, um, so the question was, so you have a ginormous tree, great, good for you. How did you figure out the decent to work? Um, I mean, the old rule of thumb from Hegel is like 20 half steps per diameter, right? So for the HRM with, you know, two, you know, two different categories, then that's Two, 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 three plus eight, right? So you three or three times twenty times six feet. Usable. Um, again, this here where if you believe in your model fit criterion, you know, it will tell you if you're doing too much. Right? So you, you can't pick up every plot. Um, yeah, right. I mean, so all these things. That's that's why this model comparison stuff is sort of a useful thing to throw. So the question was, it depends on rate. If you have a very big rate difference, then I. I don't need a lot of power to test that thing because I can I have it's just out there. If it's a tiny rate difference, yeah, it's, it's, it's a two rate model, but you don't have a lot of power to test it. Anything why do you need this model out of this? So I'm saying, you know, it's definitely this model, that model. I'm saying, you know, if it's integrated across uncertainty model, average it in the complex parameter like this. Other questions? That we that people haven't dealt with much, we can in our in our program. And so what we can do is, I mean, under basic drawing notion or any kind of process, um, that you, the entrance of variation is a little burst of variation at the start. So you have your true value and you have this wiggle from the information you have. Right? So what we can do is either um, add that in as a parameter. So if I know what my uncertainty is, I can add that in. It's basically it's like saying a branch for that little extra wiggle term. That in, or in theory, you can estimate it. Um, I was over, over told in Brian, you can estimate it, but we haven't tested it yet. So, see it that way. Um, for discrete, discrete traits, I mean, there's uncertainty there, too. Um, <coughs> with Torum, one thing that Jeremy did was excellent, was allow you to have, I don't know whether it's zero or one, you can pick both, and it will cover like a DB, you can do both. Um, but again, something we haven't advertised much. And it can really matter because you, you know, if I have lots of measurement uncertainty, that's like having a factor with every loop. Right? Or if I have a model that can get faster with all these branches, it could be you have this, 
do all the things you need to with all these paths, but then you have all this negative uncertainty in the output. So it's really difficult to keep in mind what's going to be in place. So from the standpoint of important stuff. Yeah. That also that William study about Colin. Mm. He did a great job there of measuring the lots of stuff in there. And of course, some things you see in the species, or even in an individual plant, some are bicellular, some are tricellular. So you think about everything's happening right now. Right? So you have this, you can't imagine that you get instantaneous switch from one state to the state. You need to have some kind of variation between them. And so in that case, what you do is just say, I do have one of these things in the system, you just can't do it. And keep on certain things, little says it will be good if you really can't tell that few. Which has problems too. Yeah. Are you using a, a real rate model from that moment when you just time for erases or you can Oh yeah, yeah. So there's, there's nothing about this that requires ultimate trace. Yeah. Yeah, so then Kelly's also has some questions that you have to Yeah, other questions or thoughts on this? Yeah, so none of the stuff I talked about today, it was the question is, so I'm chugging one of the species of evolved in some way, and then the speciation event happens, boom, what happens next? So you can imagine that I have you know, some change particularly with that speciation event, right? And I'm just going to isolate and change some ways of thinking about it, or something like that. The models I talked about today don't deal with that. Um, there are models that do, but Bill Mobotka has a model that can deal with this, where you can actually estimate how much change is happening along branches. The trick with that is either you have to know the full tree and figure out where all the different entities are, which you probably don't know, and I don't know. Um, or you can use something of estimating how many speciation events you need. And so you imagine this is all that has only change speciation events. Now, along the long branches, have many speciation events in session, but they feel like random change. change. You can just correct that. And so it's very clever people who can do that. Other questions about this? Thank you all for coming. It's really great. Mm -hmm. Great talk. I'd like to talk to you about your phylogeny in just a second. Okay. Thank you. That was great.